Yeah, I grew up in Perth. Uh, myself, I spent 26 years um, in and out of prisons. I spent nine years, um, literally my whole childhood in jail uh, or on the streets. Within a few months, I'm selling two and a half kilos of meth um, a day, guns, drugs, 9 mills, 44s, locks, dynamite, um, lots of cash, big factory full of gear. Um, I've got a saying, you can take the prisoner out of prison, but then you've got to get the prisoner out of the prisoner. Um, prison changes you, not for the better, but for the worse. Young soldier of God, steady march. Uh, so my name's uh, Peter Lyndon James, I'm from uh, Perth in uh, Western Australia. Yeah, well, the funny thing about it is like, yeah, I've written three different books. Um, first one is uh, Tough Love, and it uh, shows families how to help people caught up in addiction. And my second one is um, my story um, about how um, I grew up and the life that I lived. And, and um, then uh, when I got nuked, I had a, f a full on uh, encounter with God. And, um, and then I journaled for 10 years, so it includes all my journals of how I come from old life and the battle that I had to go through to change and all the stuff that I experienced. And, um, and I just started Shalom, which is a rehab for men, women, and children. Uh, they're probably the largest one in Australia. And I just wrote the story about how that unfolded and I put the three together and made the book. And, uh, and the third one is how to run a rehab. Um, especially I went to 16 different schools, only made grade six. And um, for me, trying to work out how to fix people or how to disciple people, um, using my life experiences and what I've gone through. And I just put it all into a book. Um, me, I was part of the matrix um, my whole life. And me, to the matrix, is like the government system. Um, but Shalom, what we do is not just rehabilitation, but reintegration, resocialization, um, and um, rehabilitation. Um, we focus on all the hard issues. We bring restoration, not just the, the root cause of why people are like they are. Um, we get everyone off all medications, um, including antidepressants and antipsychs. Um, we also help to restore the whole family, everyone who's been, who's been addicted by that person's wrong choices. Um, we get everyone 100% debt free, fix all their paperwork up their life and credit ratings and stuff. Um, we also focus on all the general issues. So when everyone who graduates, graduates a program, we fully furnish a house for, uh, for free and um, give them a car and a license and and we all get them working all full time um, with an employee on the same page as the rehab. Uh, myself, I spent 26 years um, in and out of prisons uh, from the age of uh, nine is when I first got put into prison. Um, mum and dad, typical story, mum and dad split up when I was a kid. I'm the second oldest. Um, dad went off with a babysitter when she was like 15 and, you know, having a couple of kids with her, left mum with five kids. And um, me, I was facing all these circumstances. I didn't understand why mum and dad split up. I just seen mum throw a pot at dad's head. I didn't know that he slept with a babysitter. Two years later, but I sort of blame my mum for driving my dad away because when my dad left, the whole family started falling apart. Uh, mum turned to the alcohol and men. Um, our quality of life went downhill. Uh, the car was taken away, the stereo, and we started moving around a fair bit. And um, yeah, mum kept making silly choices and uh, uh, drinking and, and, and with the men. She got one particular fellow she was with him uh, for many years. He was a violent fellow. He used to beat the living crap out of her. And so we'd move from school to school, suburb to suburb um, around uh, um, Perth. And um, one, of the, one, 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 one on about three o'clock in the morning, um, this bloke was beating the crap out of me mum. And I grabbed my brothers and sisters and hid underneath, hid, under, hid them underneath the bed. And um, when all the screaming and the crying stopped, I told her to stay there and I went out to the lounge room. And I was um, probably seven and I went out to the lounge room. I see my mum sitting on the end of the, the couch like this and I walked in, coming in sideways and she was bawling and she turned her head up sideways and her face was covered in blood, black eyes, and she had her false teeth in her hand and she was just crying and shaking with super glue, trying to glue her teeth back together. Um, this boy used to, you literally could say he'd rape my mum um, we'd drag her up the street, um, just done a lot of bad stuff. And my mum uh, was alcoholic and went into rehab and when she went to rehab, um, all of us kids got split up and my brothers and sisters went to my grandma and my older sister went with her best friend and I tried to stay with mum. Um, and so they put me in foster families. Um, she came out of rehab and every time she came out of rehab, she went back to the same bloke 
they used to beat the crap out of her. Um, eventually, when she went back the, to rehab, I think it was the second time, um, I was eight, and um, I got put in a foster family again. I didn't want to be in a foster family, and I tried to run away, and, and they caught me, took me back, and mum got out, and I moved back in with my mum, and uh, moved into a caravan park, she was, again went back to the same bloke who was beating the crap out of her, um, drinking and all that stuff, but I met a young kid, uh, and um, he sort of became my mate. And I remember I asked mum if I could stay over his caravan the night. And um, so I stayed over his caravan the night. And I wake up at three o'clock in the morning and this some bloke was giving me oral sex. It was my mate's uncle. And um, I laid there frozen solid and I had to pretend I was asleep. Um, but I'll tell you what, it was petrifying. Uh, what this bloke was doing to me. And um, when I got up in the morning, I walked out of the caravan and I'm walking back to the, the, my mum's van and and I heard a voice, I just felt, I was, said, tell your mum. And then I heard his other voice said, no, nah, stuff that she doesn't love you, she loves the bottom more than she loves you. And my brain thought about it, I mean, if if my mum loved me, that bloke wouldn't have, been molest, wouldn't have molested me. My dad wouldn't have taken off and dumped me. I mean, I wouldn't have been through all the stuff that I've been through. And um, yeah, I thought, no, nah, she doesn't love me anymore, but that was the day. I mean, my clearest day, I took away the right for her to speak in my life as an, as an eight-year-old kid, and I just hated her guts with a passion. And um, just, yeah, I just hated her. I started run away and started rebelling. I was angry. I was full of guilt, um, shame, uh, fear. And um, yeah, um, they ended up putting me in a children's home, another one. Um, I'd been to a couple, but they put me in this particular children's home and, and again all I wanted was my mum and my dad I wanted to be a, a geek uh, a geek to me is a uh, a normal person a productive member of society one that's free from the influence of drugs and substances as you see them mum and dad family holidays one school fixed group of friends dad teaching you know, how to do all the normal stuff and I never had any of that and um, all I wanted was my mum and my dad get run away from these children's homes sleeping good Samaritan bins and stuff. I thought Lomor was just like um, um, uh, Parker which was home or Wonsley or Waminder or Clontarf, like the other ones I've been through. Um, but I didn't know it was a prison. And so I drove to Lomor, it was 11 o'clock at night, I think 11, 12 o'clock at night. I remember pulling up a gate, up these gates, and they had six foot gates, 12 foot high gates with razor wire and all this stuff. And my heart was going like 400 mile an hour. I think so this is like, like the normal one. Um, they took me in the administration block and they um, done all the paperwork and then they took me in the bleaching block, stripped me naked, uh, put na nick cream in my hair, crab cream on my nuts, and they chucked me pyjama pants and they, they gave me my towels, six comic book books, toilet toothpaste and soap, and, and my, marched me down a row of uh, prison cells. I remember there was about 12 cells to the left, 12 to the right, Real low ceilings because of the youth prison. And um, I tell you, I've never been so scared in all my life. And um, yeah, when they, the prison officer, he opened the, opened the gate and opened the cell door, and I went in the thing and he bolted it shut, and I could hear him walking up, still hear the keys, the keys jingling. And I threw my stuff at my metal bench, and then I jumped on the bed and I cuddled my pillow, and I bawled my eyes out, rocking side to side, just flat out crying, saying, please, please, please let me out now. Um, if you let me out now, um, I'll be able to run away again. Um, I know that I know that I know that if somebody had opened that door that day, that experience scared the living crap out of me. And I know that my life would have changed and I wouldn't have run away again. I'd done nothing wrong to be put in a prison. I faced circumstances that I didn't, didn't create. And I made choices and the choices here I am in jail, and um, as I was rocking side to side in my cell crying, um, I heard a voice again, and his voice said, Peter, from this day forward, you're going to have to look after yourself. Uh, so I, I made a vow as a nine-year-old boy, and I can remember it clear as day. I said, from this day forward, I'm going to look after me. And um, I wake up the next day, stand by your door for cell inspection, clean the floors, done all that sort of stuff. And I was spending three months in that prison, and the three months that I spent in the prison, there's nearly 200 kids in there. And all them kids, they all had stories like mine. Her mum would run off with another man or dad would run off with another woman or mum and dad were bashing each other or they'd been sexually abused. They were 
the rejects of society that were doing stuff that you know, I'd never done before. And um, but it's the first time in three years um, they understood me. I understood them, and they become a family. I spent three months in that jail, and, and I honestly felt I felt at home. And when I got out of jail, they put me in another children's home, uh, Warminder, which is probably 15k out of the city. And um, I met some kids at the home that I met in, in jail, and um, I started doing what they did. I started breaking the houses, stealing cars, smoking cones, sticking pigs in my arms. Um, I'd be run away from the the, the um, home. I'd be living on the streets under the causeway, like bridges, squats, drop-in centres. Uh, I kept getting busted by the coppers. I'd go back to Lomore. I'd get six months, and then I'd get out and, um, for a week, and I'd be back in for another three months. And then once I got out for a day. But I spent seven years in Lomore um, from the age of nine to 16, seven birthdays in a row. Every, every birthday I was locked up. Um, I become what they call institutionalised. I spent nine years, um, literally my whole childhood in jail uh, or on the streets. Um, I've spent in and out of jails right up to the age of 31. Um, my whole life I just wanted to be a geek. I knew in my heart I was, I was a good person. Um, but when you get put in, when you get put in prison, um, you've got to be somebody you're not. You've got to project an image that people perceive or see to fit in with the environment that you're in. And kindness in jail is seen as a weakness. If someone comes in your slot and they want your tobacco, unless you get up and give them one, everyone's going to come in your, in your, in your, in your um, slot and just stand over you. So you, you've got to be somebody not within the prison system. And when you live in that environment for the, the amount of time that I did, um, it becomes your way of life. It becomes your standard norm. Um, I can break in a house, steal cars, sell drugs, guns, um, do all the bad stuff and I had no conscience over it for me. It was my standard norm. Um, but I knew it wasn't my standard norm. And there have been times where I tried to be like the geeks and hang around the geeks, um, but they make me feel uncomfortable. I felt like they were better than me. Um, so I went back around my family. But the problem is my family, which is the, um, the criminal, the drug addict, the alcoholic, the abused, uh, they're all doing stuff that I don't want to do anymore. And it wasn't as easy as just saying stop. But every time I was locked up, I used to go to these Christian groups come in there, um, and every time you come in, they wanted nothing from you. They just loved you. And um, they never wanted anything from you. You could let your guard down. You could just be who you were. And originally, I used to just go there for a perv on the Sheilas and have a free feed. And, and I'd done that every time I was locked up from probably nine right up to 18. And um, I always knew something was there. But um, yeah, it wasn't until uh, 19, uh, it was 1987 it was. Um, I was in Riverbank, I just got a, a 14 month whack and then they put another five months on it. Um, but this Alan Shepard and, and more, Alan and Morning Shepard and Broken Chain Ministries are coming one night and they chucked this video on. And the video is called Crossing the Switchblade. And um, I'm watching this video and, and, and the, the, the scene, and the, this fellow whose name's Nicky Cruz and this scrawny looking preacher had come down from somewhere. He got called by God to go tell this fellow that God loved him and, and had a plan and purpose for his life and all that. And I'm seeing this gang member, I'm seeing the struggles that he's going through. Um, he had the same struggle that I had. He's around all these people, um, they're staunch. I mean, he relates to them, they relate to him. But inside, he didn't want to be who he was. He didn't want to do what he was doing, but he was doing it. And, and he wanted over here, and it was just like, it was like having this big full-on spiritual battle within him. And um, it's cut a long story short anyway. They were in this big hall, and this David Wilkinson called him up, and two gang leaders up. And I just remember this gang leader falling to his knees and bawling his eyes out crying. And I'm just like, yeah, man, what's happening here? You know, just like, and, um, and then it showed the rest of the movie. He started dressing like a geek. You know, he got rid of his colours, he cut off ties with his past, he's handing out I mean, soups and bowls and food, and I'm thinking, oh, you've got to be kidding me. Man, if he can change, I can change. You know? And I went going back to my slot, and I got on my knees at night, man. I got on and I said, God, God, if you're real, if you're real and you can change that bloke's life, you can change mine. 
And I'm telling you, mate, whoa, oh, brother, his presence just smashed me. I had snot coming out my nose, tears coming out my eyes, and his just presence just filled myself. And um, he gave me a scripture um, or a verse. It was um, John 8, 32 says, uh, you will know the truth. You know, the truth will set you free, make you free. And, and, it's, and I used that for password in jail. When I was in there, I was going around telling everyone about Jesus. Um, I'd be still smoking cigarettes and people say, I thought you are a Christian. And it's like, I got a bit convicted there. And I, and I used to have these little green Bibles. And um, in the back of the Bibles, all these blank pages. I used to use the blank pages for rolly papers because it's real thin. I didn't smoke the words, though, you know. And, um, but I go around and tell everyone, I even had Bible studies in my slot. The screws let me have a couple of fellas, and then we had three or four fellas. And, and um, yeah, that's when God really, really become real, revealed himself to us. I remember just the joy and the peace, and they're just like, oh, my God. And um, anyway, I, uh, I, was, I was due to get out soon, and I had this CBOP challenge for youth camp where you go up north. And you do three weeks of trekking and a survival course on a station and walking through the hills and gullies and Abitale. And I've never done stuff like that. All I did was steal cars and do stuff. And um, and I begged them to ask because I'll never come let me go on this thing. And then I pray, God, please let me go on this thing. And God will give you what you want even when it's bad for you. Um, I shouldn't have went on that camp. And um, when I went on that camp, I stopped reading the Bible. And... Um, yeah, and within three weeks, my heart had gone hard. And uh, when I'd come back, I was supposed to move in with a pastor, and I just went straight back to the streets and doing what I'd done. And, um, yeah, but I knew God was real, and I just kept doing what I was doing. Yeah, well, me, me wife, Amanda, I've been with her 35 years. We've got two kids. I've got three kids, including my daughter. But I met Amanda when I was 19. She'd moved down from Mongan Hills. Uh, she's a gay, you know, country girl, farmer's daughter, ducks at school, head girl. Worst thing she ever did was sneak in the boys' dorm on a dare. And when I met my wife, I basically stuffed her life up. I hid a lot of what I was up to, and I was a local drug dealer at the pub, met her at a pub. I hid that from her. But I slowly introduced her to drugs and ruined her life. Um, we had two kids. Um, I've got a son, Peter, another son, Ryan. And... Um, um, the whole six years, I never spent any time with my kids. I didn't know how to be a dad. I never had a dad. Um, my wife would be looking after the kids, and I'd be out doing drugs and wheeling and dealing, doing no sleep and doing that sort of stuff. Um, I've got a saying, you can take the prisoner out of prison, but then you've got to get the prisoner out of the prisoner. And even though I was in prison, I was in prison. I don't care what people say. I didn't, I didn't physically spend 26 years in prison. I mean, I spent 26 years in prison. You can take the prisoner out of prison, but then you've got to get the prisoner out of the prisoner. Um, prison changes you, not for the better, but for the worse. And it separates and makes two cultures of society. But uh, wherever, I, wherever I went, I knew I'd go to a town, Kalgoorlie, start off with a packet, get to an eight ball, get to an ounce. And then when the Queensland done the same thing, just kept running for myself. For, you know, five years later, two kids moved back to Perth. Um, got in a whole heap of fraud and a whole heap of other stuff. Got a three year whack. Um, two days after my son was born, coppers got us. Um, I got busted with the yeah, coppers got me anyway. I put him in, in jail for three years and then um, done one year or three years, got out and I thought, man, I've been sticking picks, bars, smoking pipes uh, for long enough. I just do it seriously. Got out of jail, moved in with my wife, got my own house. And I just started selling drugs, not dealing hot gear, just focused purely on drugs. And within a few months, I'm selling two and a half kilos of meth. Um, a day, heaps of guns, drugs, 9 mills, 44s, locks, dynamite, um, lots of cash, big factory full of gear. Um, I was under really heavy surveillance. I used to get raided every every three months. Um, but I knew my house was bugged, my car was bugged, my office was bugged. Uh, I caught them, you know. And plus I've had psychosis and other stuff, but I know I saw what I saw. But, um, um, yeah, still trying to be a dad. I'd leave my wife home, go 16 days, no sleep. And sleep with prostitutes, sleep with women. My wife knew what I was up to, people would tell her. And I just left her at home and just did what I did. Um, I remember in uh, 2001, um, I'd done 16 days no sleep. And I'd slept and I'd wake up. And then all of a sudden a helicopter was over the roof. I had TRG, shotguns, brought for his three all the windows over the top, out the back. And um, I remember looking at my wife laying in the in, in a hallway um, with my one-year-old son, one-half-year-old son in her arms, 
with a shotgun to her head. And um, all those years, like I said, I always just wanted to be normal. Um, I just, I don't know, looking, seeing her with a gun to her head and my other kid screaming his head off. I got done with a pound of pot, a couple of handguns, and my crash is dead now. He got done with an ounce of meth, and I'm getting seven years, 144 months. I remember when he got out, he texted me. Um, but um, yeah, he'd done 144 months and died a week after he got out. But I got out on bail. Um, my sister-in-law bailed me out. And um, I went back to home. And uh, my wife, being a country girl, she used to play sports and hockey and all that stuff. And I'm honest, I've never played any, any sport. Um, but it was like two days later, a day later, and she'd enrolled me in this grasshopper soccer thing. And what I'm, what I'm about to tell you is where, where the big turning point in, in my life was that um, when she enrolled him in this kids' grasshopper soccer, there's a bit of Oz kickers for five year olds, six year olds. It's introduction to a sport. And so I took him over the road to this thing. And them days, I used to have bling on all my fingers and bling and chains and, and look like a right idiot. And, um, but the deal was that we had to stand in this circle. And, 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 and if the kid kicked the ball through the, the dad's legs, then the dad had to roll around on the ground, coo -choo 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 type thing, make him all full fluffy. And um, so I'm watching these kids do it, this one, and this geek falls down, and there you goose. And then this one does not there you goose. And my heart's going, boom, 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 boom. I'm thinking, man, if he does that to me, boy, I'm out of here. And um, yeah, mate, he kicked the ball through my legs, eh? And um, I just turned around and left him there. And I um, turned my back on my son and I cried. And I really, I really, really cried. I wouldn't give anything to make my boy feel special. I just don't know how. And then people say, well, you know, but I didn't know how. And how do you, I just couldn't humble myself to do that in front of them. You know what I mean? And I turned my back on my son and I cried. And I walked back across the road. And I remember, I remember saying, God, if you, I need your help. You know, I don't want this anymore. And, um, yeah, you heard my prayer, but not in the way that I wanted him to. And uh, I went over to the woman, and I said, woman, you've got to go look after the boy. And so she went after the boy, and I just sat there and sulked. Um, but that, that was the day where I'm um, channeling chaos um, come into my life. Everything just well, turned into like a, a sci-fi movie. And I just pulled my eyes out my whole life. I just wanted a home, a place to call home. I went to 16 different schools, only made grade six. And I moved every three months of my whole life, even with my wife, every three months. And I just sat there and cried. Man, I'll tell you, for about three days to my wife, I said, something weird's going down. She said, too much drugs. I'm saying, something weird's going down, I'm telling you. She goes, no, you're not too much drugs. I said, listen. And I said, right, I've got a plan. i got a brand new VN1500 Cruiser. And I had it in the carport. I had a big factory full of cars and bikes and all the stuff, and I'll pull out 20 grand here, 30 grand, I just pull it up, I had this brand new VN 1500 Cruiser, and, um, and I got her, and I said, all right, flick the roller door up, and then I'll give it up. And so she flicked, <laughs> flicked the roller door up, and I just snaked it, you know, just straight out the front of the house, straight through the, the dirt, it was like 200 metres of beach sand, and hit the highway. <laughs> and I thought, now, nah, they won't catch up to me now, you mate. Know? I even went over the top of a footbridge. And um, so I lost the coppers, and... Um, and then I'm driving along, and I'm out in a place called Wanneroo's out near the coast. And I'm driving along, and I'm heading out of this near up, and I hear this voice, Peter, I want you to follow me, I want you to follow me. Oh, mate, pulled the handbrake on, got off the side of the road, ripped the helmet apart, pulled the skin out, trying to look for the microphone that was in the helmet that said the voice, and there's still nothing there. So I walked over the other side of the road, I started hitching. And, um, and uh, yeah, I just put my thumb out, and within five minutes, this young couple pulled over. And uh, I got in the back seat of the car. That would have been 1920. And, and, and um, yeah, he was driving. She's a passenger seat. I'm sitting in the back seat of this car. And um, my driver along, he says, oh, yeah, I'm just going to get a phone box, mate. And this is, this is up. And we got about probably not even three, four car out the road. And this dude, he, he, he leans over and he says, mate, I really feel like I'm going to tell you something. And I say, yeah, what's that? And he said, God wants me to tell you that he loves you and that he has a plan and a purpose for your life. When he said that God told me to tell you um, that he loves you, I just burst at it, mate. I just broke down. But my eyes, I hadn't heard from God since I was in the riverbanks, you know, 15 years before. And I said, bro, get me out of your car. 
And so I made him pull over. And I got out of the car and I went in the bush and had a good soup. I blew the snot out of my nose and cleaned my beard up. And I walked inside and I said, I remember I used to have a competition with another mate, the one that died, um, who could get the biggest diamonds and bling and chains. And I put all my chains off, pulled my rings off, and I threw them in the bin. Um, for nearly two, three weeks, someone, ever since I prayed that prayer, is leading me all over Perth, offering me everything I ever wanted. And I want, I want, I want this, I want to change. Yeah, and I, and I was, I mean, went inside, told the missus, so we've got to get out of here. She was going to ask to get out of here, grab your bag, pack some clothes tonight, we're off. I found this motel, so I moved into the motel, you know, and, and, and then I went to sleep. And, um, and I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, man, and I had a dream. And, um, and in my dream, and God was telling me, um, you're going to travel the world with a group of Christian people, and you're going to tell them how it changed your life. And um, that fa same feeling that I had when I was 17 in Riverbank, his presence was just watching me. I'm bawling my eyes out. Basically, just sped up a bit. We drove around all day. Every time I tried to try to pull a church, I heard his voice, not that church, not that church. Um, that afternoon, 5 o'clock, um, 4.30, I put in this church, in Morley, New Life Church. And the um, second I walked in the doors, the kids went that way. And then me and the missus went this way. Um, but I walked in the door, the second I did, man, I tell you, what, every part of me started shaking. I'm bawling my eyes out crying. And um, at the end, he gave an older call. If you're sick of your life and you want to change, um, if you're sick of your life, you're sick of your sin, and you want to change your life, God's here to say that he's going to help you. Just come to the front. I mean, I went up the front and prayed the prayer, bawled like a two-year-old, heard this voice loud as a day. It said, now give up everything you own and follow me. And... Um, yeah, I gave my heart to the Lord. My wife came up with me. Um, she just didn't want to be left in the seat. She didn't understand what was happening. And, um, and then so I did exactly that. I went and gave away the cars, went and gave away all the hot goods, everything I bought with drug money. I emptied my house out and I moved out to Jinjin Caravan Park. Um, at the time, I was on bail for a pound of pot, a couple of handguns. I had a dodgy lawyer. I swapped my dodgy lawyer for a legit lawyer. And, um, yeah, I just slept for days. Um, I spent three weeks out in the caravan park, four weeks. I was on bail for court. But when I was out there, uh, he said, I want you to write your life out. Um, and so when I wasn't sleeping, I'd write. And when I wasn't sleeping, I'd write. And I wrote right up to the point where he did what he did. And then I heard him say, now we've written the first half, let's write the second. And I praised it up and I didn't look at it for 20 years. And that's the first part of my second book. Um, but I ended up going to court, got four months jail. And... Um, and even that, man, I'm telling you, he's a logistical mastermind. He can put a 1,000 people in one place for half a second just for you. And how he had favours in the courts. I've been to courts thousands of times, mate. I've been first court, second floor, third floor. And, mate, I was at the 10th floor. I only had a judge, a prosecutor, and two other people. And they're all doing whatever they could to give me favour. They dropped they had a handgun charge. They dropped these, but they had to give me four months jail for, um, for the licence. I'm telling you, whatever it was, whoever that, it was just, I reckon the surveillance crew that had an the surveillance seen that I'd really done an effort to give up everything and just the way that God did what he did. And um, anyway, I got full on jail, but my God, that's the best lagging I've ever done. Man, talk about Casuarina. I got put in with the lifers. I was in five block. I had best steaks and I had best feed and no standover, no bullying, no crap. I mean, I got the best job in the jail, on the quads, drive around, did with the food trolleys. But it was just like, makes me miss jail. You know, it was got a favour of God in there. And then I got transferred to Carnet uh, for my last month or so. And even that, best part of the jail, best job. I'd go in there and tell everyone about Jesus, you know. And um, I'd become a full-on God-botherer. I mean, if you didn't want to be about Jesus, bro, you better run. <laughs> and they, they gave me the nickname, the God-botherer, proselytizer. Um, anyway, when I was in jail, um, God told me through, he speaks to me through the radio, you know, and I mean, it's like, uh, it's a whole heap of stuff, mate. But anyway, he's, and he told me I wanted to go to Bible college. So I sent out all these letters to Bible college while I was in jail. And one particular college got back to me, Riverview Bible college. And so I got out of jail and, and then I arranged to go to Bible college. And um, I remember the first day of Bible college, I walk in there and this bloke goes, to will be a cuddle off for be about cracking one. I mean, it's not, I don't come from a culture where you cuddle. And, um, but this is JJ, he's like a full on Christian dude. We went and cuddled me. And he's like, and I was sitting at the back of the class, 
all these geeks, there's like 160 students and there's me, I'm sitting about the back of the class. And I spent three years at Bible College, done cert for a minute, so I didn't think I'd get there. I've never studied cert for, then I've done a diploma in theology, then I've done advanced diploma in theology. But the three years that I was at church, um, every day I kept saying, God, I can't be like them, I can't be like them, I can't be like them. I mean, I want to be like them, but I just can't be like them. And it took three years, and one day I'm walking up the corridor in church, he says, I didn't ask you to be them, I asked you to be you. And I was like, well, that's a big load. And God says, Pete, it's okay to wear a singlet, it's okay to wear shorts, it's okay to say ducks don't speak and eat scooter. I mean, it's okay, just be you. And, um, and so I just was me. And then that voice, I often tell people who don't believe in God, there's a light, there's a dark, there's a good, there's a bad, there's a God, there's a devil, you call it light and dark. Um, but they're on your shoulder, and, and that's the one that says, Peter, you're making a mistake. The other one says, no, stuff him. You call it your conscience, you call it whatever you want, but that's God, and that's the devil. Well, that's the light and that's the dark. And, and we are where we are because of our choices. But three years there, um, then I went from there to Acacia Prison. Um, after, in 2005, I, I uh, volunteered as a prison chaplain um, at Australia's largest private prison. I was in there three days a week. Um, first day in the prison, I walked in after doing my induction and I seen all the boys and stuff. And one fellow, he said, hey, Lyndon James, what are you doing here? And I said, I've got, I got the keys, but the. <laughs> and um, I knew all the fellas in jail because I grew up with them, you know. And um, they'd just be going in and out, in and out, in and out. Like I've been going in and out, in and out, in and out. But this time I'm in with Jesus and I'm not, and I can walk out, you know. And, um, I got a call one day from the jail. I'd just done some changes. And the jail says, Pete, listen, we really appreciate you being coming here for the last five years. The superintendent actually rang me. Um, but we can't be in anymore. I said, why is that? And he said, well, the Department of Justice have you know, ain't gone on anyone with a criminal record because the drugs that's been getting smuggled into Kettingvale. Um, they have, they've shut the door on you. And um, so, man, I took it pretty hard because I just spent five years selling it to them fellas and, and then I just I heard a voice or something that says, you failed God. And um, I remember saying, yeah, that's what I failed God. And, um, yeah, I just remember walking past my office desk, grabbing my keys, and um, reading and I had to find somebody who wasn't a Christian. And it was a girlfriend from about 30 years back, and I went and scored an eight ball. And, um, yeah, and I just slept with her, smashed the eight ball over a day or two. I've been a Christian 10 years. And, um, yeah, slept by my ice went to the knockers. Slept with a couple of prostitutes. And then when I come home, I had to tell my wife what I did. Ten, ten years of becoming a Christian. And if you had told me that, um, that I could afford, I would have thought, no, nah, I don't know the world I could fall. You know? Man, I went from a God bothering prostatizing Christian. Man, I'll tell you what, I'm so sorry for what I did. Um, I love God, God's my dad. And um, yeah, I just really should have done that. And um, yeah, I had to tell my wife what I did and I had to walk her through not, not um, hating the woman that I'd done it with because she knew her. And uh, yeah, but that began 13 years of hell. And then I was in this big pit. Um, and that began, like I said, the 13 years of hell. Um, I believed and I opened the door spiritually that allowed all this crap in. Um, and so from 2010 onwards, I started this shed ministry. Um, first text out, I had 200 blocks rock up. I um, was sitting up there interviewing people about life, a bit like what you do, and um, the struggles we have as men. And when I'm not on the thing, I'm in the tool on my knees. God, where are you? God, where are you? God, where are you? God. I've never felt so alone in the last 13 years. Um, but yet I have to go up there and when people want you to pray for them, you've got to pray when you don't want to pray. And you've got to encourage people when you feel like you're going to hell. But it humbled me and it broke me 2012, in 2010 and 2012 when I wasn't doing the shed ministry. I'd be um, volunteering in the streets in Perth. And, um, yeah, and, and all these people kept coming to me, asking me, asking me to help them change their life like I changed mine. And um, so... 
I'd take him to this rehab, and I'd take him to this rehab, and I'd take him to this rehab. And once they even had a bus and took 12 down to one particular rehab. And they just kept coming, mate. And um, but every rehab, and I volunteered all these different places, all they did was take them from an illegal drug to a legal drug. Well, they, they took him to this one, and that was just two Christianese. It was just like pushing stake down the kids. It was like, hallelujah, praise the Lord, glory here and glory there. And, mate, and over here, it was just like, it wasn't truth. It was just Band-Aid stuff. Um, and that was the beginning of Shalom, basically. I thought, instead of all these other rehabs aren't working, I mean, I've been part of the system, prison system, matrix in and out, in and out. Um, I've seen it as a, a, a prison chaplain for five years. I'm going in and out, in and out. Um, two and a half years of all these rehabs, none of them are working. Um, I'll have a crack at it. And that's what I felt God was saying, have a crack. And um, I thought it was easy enough as just sticking four fellas in there and putting out a couple of house rules. But my God, yeah, I didn't ask to run rehabs. It's like it was the last thing I would have chose, you know. But you don't get a choice. And, and, and basically for the next 10 years, I developed stage one, which goes for around three months and then and then I wanted to I've cleaned up the heart and because the heart out of the heart flow the issues of life or out of the heart flow the consequence of life. It's about cleaning the heart up. Ninety percent of the people that I deal with, the root cause of why they are like they are is childhood trauma. And so I just discipled them and I and I and I started working on cleaning their heart up. The word shalom means love in its purest form, truth, honesty, and I call it a shalom discipleship house begin with end in mind. And they come in bust and broke and they go out shalom. We're 100% self-funded. God has given me everything that I needed over the last few years. And, 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 and he's done what he's done, not because of me, but in spite of me. And if it wasn't for me stuffing up, he used to say to me, Psalm 46.10, Psalm 46.10. Well, I know what Psalm 46.10 says. It says, be still and know that I'm God. And in the jail, he kept saying, Psalm 46.10. And one day I picked up my little book of my but it was a NASAB, New American Standard Translation. I picked it up and said, cease striving. Be still and know that I'm God. Unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain and build it. He let me have five years of running around like a proselytizing, preaching Christian in a jail, being a God brother. I've probably done more harm than good. And then he humbled the living crap out of me. You know, and it's like when I stuck out picking my arm, I was 10 years as a Christian, um, I used to tell people, how dare you, how dare you, and here I am. I mean, humble pie. And, 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 and it's just like every day, it was just like, I was like a timid cat. Um, I had no plans, I just need to get through today. Seek first the kingdom of God, just one day at a time, one day at a time, one day at a time. How I used to walk was flat out, now I'm just like, and, and I've just watched over the last 10 years what he has done. And he's, he's got each house. He taught me. I used to have dreams of showing me what it is and how to do it. And so we've got stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, stage five, um, 160 residents, men, women, and children. And I've watched him do what he'd done, not because of me, but in spite of me. And no man, no man could come up with what he's come up with. He's just a good, good dad. And, 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 and it's not about religion. It's about a relationship with the living God that loves us. And as you learn to listen to the light of your conscience, or what do you want to call it, the more you learn to listen, the louder and louder it gets. And that's God's voice. That's God. He's, he's a good God. One wants to give you life, one wants to give you death. How do I get joy just seeing what he does? 100% self-funded, 160 people. You know what I mean? It's just like, how do you do it? It's like, how do you run it all? It's like, it's unexplainable. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's just like you know, people come in and say, how do you do it? It's just like, my, my, my chairman, he's the um, second in charge of Woodside. He's my chairman on board, and he's like, how do you do it? It's like, I don't know. <laughs> you know it's just like he just does what he does. God, God does what he does. My whole organization is run by ex-addicts that, that, that are either in the program or who have been through the program. You know, and it's amazing. He, he calls the unqualified and he qualifies them. Um, for me, faith starts with a prayer. When no one else is around, you're just saying, God, if you're real, I want you in my life. That one step, he says, if you take one step towards him, he'll take a thousand towards you. He, he's not going to push himself on you. You're not a weed. You are good enough. You do belong. Um, and I'll tell you what, the life that you have in him. No eye has seen, no ear has heard. No mind could ever conceive what God has prepared for those who love him, for those who have been called. If you've watched this podcast from beginning to end, you've been called by God. 
your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. He's calling and he's knocking on the door. Pray the prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.